they, when I said that I was spending that much time, that wasn't necessarily on the content itself. That was engaging with the community, um, and making friends and supporting people and being part of this like ecosystem. And cause like when you put, put in, it will give back. So if you're just pumping out content, hoping to go viral, but you're never engaging with anyone, you're not going to grow a natural and healthy community. Welcome to the Sugar Daddy Podcast. I'm Jessica. And I'm Brandon. And we're the Norwoods, a husband and wife team here to demystify the realm of dollars so it all makes sense while giving you a glimpse into our relationship with money and each other. We are so glad you're here. Let's get started. Our content is intended to be used and must be used for informational purposes only. It is very important to do your own analysis before making any investment based upon your own personal circumstances. You should take independent financial advice from a licensed professional in connection with or independently research and verify any information you find in our podcast and wish to rely upon whether for the purpose of making an investment decision or otherwise. Hey, babe. I am so excited about today's episode. We are talking about side hustles and social media influencers And y'all, we have such a treat. Lulu is one of my Instagram besties. And we were just talking before the show. Yes, we are Instagram friends, but we're also friends in real life, which is like the only bright spot for me (laughs) in social media these days, because y'all know I hate it. But when you come out of social media with an actual friend, it's incredible. And I just love it. And Lulu is the bomb, y'all. I'm going to tell you about her in just a second. But hi, Lulu. Thanks for being here with us. Oh, it's so great to be here with you. Thanks so much for asking me to join you all. Oh my gosh. I like could not think of a better person for all the reasons. I feel like you're the only person that like meets complete strangers on uh, social media and then becomes like actual real life friends with them. It's what I do. (laughs) It's like my superpower. (laughs) This isn't the first time this has happened. (laughs) I mean, listen, if you're looking for a real connection, right? Like I'm a genuine person. What you see is what you get at all times. And sometimes you just like strike gold and you find these connections and you have to hold on to them because that's the only good part about social media. But I do also say that you're a type of person who doesn't know a stranger. See, me on the other hand, I will never make a friend via social media, just That's not me. Like, talk to people. Also, that's how guys are. So I think it's a little different. Yeah. Well, <laughs> lucky for you, I make friends that you can then also be friends with. Yes. And our circle just keeps growing with like amazing people. So thank you, Lulu, for being here. You are not just, I mean, how do you feel about being in a room with curlies right now? <laughs> that's that's my life that's my life that's that's, that's my life you our children <laughs> every day and then my mom being around like yeah yeah all the curls okay so brandon is surrounded by curls today lulu curls are popping they look amazing thank Thanks you for like, you know you showed up today so y'all let me tell you about lulu because she is not only a dear friend but she is a fellow curly and that is her side hustle. She is a curly girl influencer, but in her day job, she is a marketing professional in the water industry with over 14 years of experience, including innovation and new product development, market research, marketing strategy, and communications. And over the last five years, she has also built an online community of more than 200,000 people across her social media channels focused on celebrating curly hair and encouraging others to embrace their natural hair texture. Y'all, Lulu is the real deal. Her following just keeps growing, growing, growing. Her engagement is out of this world because she's like the most genuine, sweet person ever. And like, this is what you deserve. I'm so proud of you. The Passion Project became a paying side hustle as she has now been sponsored by a number of brands to create and share content about the products she loves to use. Lulu is based in Colorado, where she loves to explore the outdoors with friends and her dog, Frankie. She also enjoys traveling, learning about astronomy, and studying language. Lulu, thank you for being on the Sugar Daddy Podcast. Oh, thank you for having me. Oh, it's such a pleasure to be connected with you both. So I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Yes. So I know that you listen to the podcast, and we always talk about side hustles. These are uncertain times you know, on LinkedIn, all you're seeing is like, I'm open to work, I'm open to work, right? Friends and family are being laid off left and right. So we really talk about what are you doing? What can you do to monetize something in your life, right? Like, are you good at baking cakes? Should you be reviewing resumes? 
what can you do? You fell into becoming an influencer, right? (laughs) (laughs) Tell us about that journey because I know, I know the backstory, but our audience needs to know that this is like, you didn't set out to become a curly girl influencer. So tell us about how this all came to be. Yeah, so definitely did not set out to do this initially. Um, it just kind of blossomed over time. Um, and it's been amazing, but it, it, it started out as just an opportunity for me to, uh, learn more about myself. I straightened my hair for 17 years and then, um, found this online community of, um, people with curly hair who were sharing their, uh, tips and tricks with each other and really helping each other. And so, um, I wanted, to, at first I was just kind of this silent observer and then I wanted to participate. And so I created this Instagram page, um, called Curly Hulu. And I didn't think that, I mean, I'm a, I'm a marketer by trade, right? And I did not think that was going to be my brand. I just picked that <laughs> name out of the, out of the blue. Um, and uh, started to share my curly journey and what I was learning about my hair um, and also asking for help. You know, I'd post results and say, okay, this is what I'm dealing with today. And like curly friends would come in and, you know, comment and help me figure things out. And and then as I started to learn more and share more, people would come asking more questions. So my content started to evolve really naturally, just kind of based on conversations that I was having in the community, whether I was looking for support or sharing some I had learned. Um, And so I started in August of 2017 with just my page, thinking it was kind of like a diary for myself, not intending to have a following. And then um, starting to reach out into the community and meet people. And um, then around January of 2018 is when I had a thousand followers. And that blew my mind because I never thought a thousand people would have (laughs) any interest in something I have to say about anything, let alone my hair. Um, So (laughs) that's when I started to think about, you know, well, what, what am I doing with this? And, and, do I want to grow this? I I never thought I'd have a topic that would be interesting. And so I think that's around the time that I started to be a little more intentional with my content creation and trying to grow my page. Um, Still not necessarily with the goal of it of monetizing. It was just more to like reach a broader audience with a topic I was becoming really passionate about. Um, The deeper connection for me that kind of also evolved in this space was empowerment and helping other people. Um, I, I had received a lot of help early on in my curly journey of how to, you know, take care of my hair and, and it led to a deeper Um, understanding and and love for myself as a human. So it kind of had this like deeper, um, deeper. It is a journey, y'all. Yeah, it's a journey. journey. It's a journey. It's a journey. Yeah, (laughs) absolutely. I saw, I saw people's transition posts, you know, where they're showing Mm -hmm. six months of change. And I, that, that blew my mind because I, I always thought I had ugly curly hair and I didn't realize it just maybe took some time to kind of let it, let it heal and, and figure out how to care for it. So, um, just so, yeah. hair is completely different now than when we first started dating. Yeah. In a good way. Yeah. Really? He'll, be like, he'll be like in the kitchen drinking coffee and he'll just like pick a curl or his thing. Like when we're brushing teeth at the end of the day is like, let me pick my favorite curl today. So he'll just like, you know, it's, it's really funny. I'm like, we could just make an entire page of like Brandon picking his favorite curl out of my head every night. Um, <laughs> But it's true. When we look back at pictures, like my hair was so much longer, but the ends were straight and stringy. And you were like, more like wavy than I would say curly. It was wavy. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, Lulu calls it whirly. Oh. Wavy and curly. <laughs> it's like the cutest. Yeah, whirly. Um, but it's so true. And then same, my journey, right? Like I've been on this for several years now. And now I have these tight ringlets, really similar to our daughter's. My hair can like not go past my shoulders. It's just like a constant struggle of like my hair is not growing, even though I know it's growing, but my ringlets are so tight that I just like, I can't get it past my shoulders. It's just like going to take 10 years, but it just keeps getting curlier. So it just keeps getting shorter. (laughs) Exactly. It's like, okay, it's getting healthier. I know this, which is good, but in that health it's just like boing, 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 boing. You know, I'm like, come on, let's get past the shoulders. But 
anyway, I just, it is a journey. Anybody with textured hair that is going natural or transitioning or, you know, embracing the kink curl, all the things, it is a journey. It's been a while since I had shoulder length hair. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Brandon used to have locks. So <laughs> he gets it. I yeah. want to see pictures. <laughs> they were not great. It's oh, not my favorite. They were the blocks were fine. She just doesn't prefer me with them. It's a not my favorite book. Yeah, <laughs> it's not my thing. Not on him anyway. <laughs> okay, so you were talking about your diary. You know your diary, and then you started seeing the growth. You had a thousand followers, and you were like, "Okay, the marketing brain t- kick, kick, kicked in." And you were like, "What can I do? What should I be doing?" Yeah. Yep. And I got really passionate about the topic too, which I think is important if, if you, you know, for anyone interested in starting a page and wanting to grow a following, it's got to be a topic you're really excited and interested in. Um, and so, yeah, for me, there was like this deeper connection around self love and helping people kind of embrace a part of themselves that they maybe thought was undesirable. Um, and so, yeah, then I started to create more content and start, started to learn about content creation. I, even though I have a marketing brain and I come from the marketing world and those list of things you mentioned at the beginning, none of that was ever like content creation. I've, right. I don't know how to do photography. I don't know how to edit. Um, you know, I, I did know how to write. And so captions kind of came naturally to me, but, um, you know, and then in 2017, when I started, it was Instagram was heavily photo and that's changed over time to be heavily video, which is another thing I had to learn that I didn't just know. Um, and so, so yeah, so then it, it started to grow pretty fast once I started to be intentional about spending time and, and coming up with, um, you know, kind of a content calendar and planning ahead and, and, um, starting to be, I started to go about it in a much more intentional way, like improving my, um, photo skills, and really paying attention to the data. So Instagram gives you a ton of information about um, your audience and how your posts are performing. And so I used to pay attention to that and and really um, kind of adapt my content based on what I saw my um, audience really enjoying. Um, and then I would also ask them, I'm a market researcher. So that piece came in um, as well, where I would ask my audience what they wanted to see and how they felt about my content. And I was, I've just kind of always been evolving based on, you know, feedback and, and that kind of the, the voice of my audience. Um, so yeah, so fast forward to, to now I've got about, yeah, 200,000 followers, which is still mind-blowing for me even though a lot of people Lou that's crazy I mean I'm one of them Avi but (laughs) your content is fantastic (laughs) Uh, thanks so much yeah it's it's been it still blows my mind that like it's just like that day that I noticed a thousand people you know I still feel that way it's it's a very humbling experience but it's been amazing and um I would say that it started to become a side hustle um, when I reached about 20,000 followers. So that's when it started to um, become an opportunity to also make money while talking yeah. about something that I really enjoy. So um, do you remember your first monetized deal? Like, yes. Who initiated? Were you like out there pitching yourself? Like, okay, I've got 20,000 followers. These are my favorite brands. I'm going to start like pitching myself, putting myself out there, trying to get my name out. Or did somebody come to you? So all those things you just mentioned, I highly recommend doing, but that's not what I did. (laughs) (laughs) In fact, I've never really pitched myself, um, which is something I I would do if this was a full-time gig. Um, so it's because it's a, a side gig, um, I've kind of just gone naturally with brands that kind of approach me and, and, um, and that I, or a lot of times I'll get a brand's attention because I've started using their products on my own. And then they are like, Oh, you know, we want to work with you. And yeah. so that's what happened with my first partnership. Um, I bought a bounce curl gel at the time. Uh, I think that was yeah. the only product they were producing and I'd heard rave reviews and I wanted to try it. And, um, it just seemed like an amazing brand. I love their founder. Um, I love everything that brand. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And so I started using um, the gel and posting about it and they reached out and said, Hey, like, we'd love to, to partner with you. Um, which I did not do that intentionally. Now I have, you know, like I've kind yeah. of flirted with brands since <laughs> I don't, You're like, hey. I, don't pitch. <laughs> I don't pitch, but I might, you know, try something out. And, and, and if I post about it sometimes, well, very often now I'll, I'll get contacted, but, um, yeah. But yeah, that I'll never forget. I have pictures. Um, my boyfriend took pictures of me when I was posting for the first time and it was a sponsored post. It was very exciting. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, okay. Here's a call out though. This is something that I loved about Lulu from the very beginning, because I'm all about transparency. I'm all about genuine interaction connection. And when you post something, I always know that A, if you didn't like it, you're going to say that, right? Paid or not. Mm-hmm. You always share, is this like um, like an affiliate link, aka if you purchase this with this link, Lou's going to get a, a something from it, right? Like she's going to get paid. Yep. Or is it just a regular link? Like this is a discount code with no strings attached, or here's a discount code, but I'm going to get a kickback. Yep. Um, I know that she only works with brands that like she you know, admires their work, their platform, their mission, because we've talked about, and we're not going to call out the brands, right? I know you know <laughs> what I'm thinking of, but we've talked about brands who like, you know, their product might be great, but when they start posting like political things or just crazy stuff that's going on in the news and it does not align with our moral compass. And we like, I mean, they're not reaching out to me, but they've reached out to her to be like, Hey, you know, can you do that? And she's like, Nope, you do not align with who I am as a person, right? Like, Lulu yeah. is an ally. She and she stands for it. And she's not just going to take a paycheck. And there are plenty of influencers, curly and non, who are like, oh no, that doesn't align. But like, I'm going to take your money. Right. Yeah. And it's like, well, where do you draw the line? So I know when Lou is like, hey, I love this product, that she actually loves it. She also is really good about being like, hey, I paid for this myself. I wanted to try this. This is sponsored. This is not sponsored. This is an ad. This is not an ad. So it's always very clear, right? And there's some brands and some influencers where you're like, "Mm, do you really feel that way? Did you really start (laughs) taking those vitamins on your own? Or did they send you a big old package, right? Like, I definitely do feel as though um, that was a lot of what initially happened. Like, you know, everybody was being sponsored. Everybody was being sponsored. Or you think it's trash, but you just got a paycheck. And now it really seemed as though like the ones that are actually, you know, um, shining through is due to them being genuine and transparent. Yeah. Like, listen, get your money, get your coins. I love that. Do you, but be honest about it. Like don't (laughs) try to hide it. If it's a partnership. It's kind of funny that you say that because um, there are celebrities now that are in the process of being sued because of not having the transparency that, you know, they should have had in regards to certain companies Mm -hmm. that I'm not going to personally name, but, they were within the they, cryptocurrency space and are no longer around. And a lot of people are money has been taken. <laughs> listen, and these are big name have, celebrities that are the paid sponsorship, you know, tag now, which makes it even easier. You can start, you know, with this is sponsorship. This is an affiliate link, et cetera. Like you don't have to be shady and Lulu's never shady, which I so appreciate. Cause even you post about, um, you're a teeny tiny little thing, right? But you post <laughs> about, like some of your clothes and your jewelry and just we're not, we're not small shaming. No. <laughs> hey, <Yeah>. it's cool. <laughs> but like you petite fashion, right? It's also yeah. something that sometimes you you tie in and it's the same thing. Like you will share brands that you love that you've naturally found, or you'll also share if it is, you know, a partnership or if they send something, you always share that it's gifted, you didn't buy it. And I just appreciate that in the world of you know, filters, everybody's trying to share their best life. It's like, what's really going on? Just can you be real for just two seconds? And I feel like you've always been yourself. Something that I really like that you had said was, is when I'm working with clients, one of our, you know, main focuses is income maximization. So is there anything you can do to improve, you know, the income you have coming into your main, you know, uh, career or even a side hustle? And when it comes to side hustles, you know, you check both of the boxes. One, what are you already good at? Like, what do you already have skills in? Marketing. How can I turn that into a side hustle? And then in addition and with the side hustle is having a passion for it because it makes it so much easier to do and it doesn't necessarily feel quote unquote like work. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because 
I was thinking before you hopped on the podcast, I was thinking about how much I work and I have, you know, as we mentioned, I have this marketing corporate day job that requires, you know, 50 plus hours a week. And there have been times I wouldn't say I'm at that at the moment, but over the last, you know, few years of building this Instagram, there have been times where it's 30 additional hours a week on top of my day job. And so, yeah, I mean, if it feels like work, and especially if your main hustle feels like work, then you're just not going to be happy and you'll get burnt out real fast. So um, yeah, I, for me to spend that kind of time on it, it has to be something that I really enjoy and and feel passionate about. Absolutely agree with that. I think that's such a good call out too. Like you just mentioned, sometimes it is an additional 30 hours of work, right? I think everybody that wants to monetize uh, Instagram is like, Oh, I'm going to go viral. It's just going to be easy. It's going to be an (laughs) overnight. Like, you know, and even I had my little moments of like, why is this not working? Why is it not going faster? I'm looking at the data. I'm looking at the analytics. Why did this one reel get 10,000 views in the first two minutes? And then like, and I, and it was usually, this was, was, was frustrating to me. And you know, this, cause we talk about all the time, but the things that I would spend time on, right? Time editing, curating, lighting, this, that, man, it'll have like 200 views in three months, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then when I'm like flippantly <laughs> like, mm, let me throw this up. Boom, explodes, right? And my my explosions are not your explosions, right? But for me and my level, it was like, what? How did that get 10,000 views in the first hour? Like, what? Mm-hmm. And it just was so frustrating. And to me, social media, aside from like these kinds of relationships being built and growing is very draining for me. So the fact that you've maintained it and that it kind of recharges you and you've monetized it really is incredible. But I do want to call out, it is a business. You were talking about like going from static posts to videos and now those videos are reels and you have to like do all the things and all the images and all the music and all. And it's like, it's a business, right? And you have to learn, you have to upskill, you have to be connecting with other people who are, you know, maybe at 300,000 followers or 400,000 followers. Like, what are they doing in comparison? Because I know you've been so helpful to me in sharing tips and tricks and what are you doing and what ring light are you using? And, you know, for anybody who's like, I want to do something on Instagram or any social media know that it is work and it is not, most people don't go viral. Most people are not that lucky. And even I've seen people go viral and then boom, they end up with like 160,000 followers. And then you check in with them two months later and they're down to 60,000, right? Yeah. And yeah. they just plummet because they don't know how they got there. They don't look at the analytics. They don't know how to maintain that audience. Mm-hmm. And then you also have people, I think when I started following you, I don't know if you were right at 100,000 or if you were maybe in the 70, 80,000, but you've boomed, right? And it's because of that consistency. And I've seen people who, you know, were at 100,000 and they're trickling down and they aren't maintaining. So it can go both ways. Absolutely. If you're not intentional. And I like that you keep using the word intentional. So, yeah. Yeah. You brought so many good points just then. And that's the thing is, is, most people don't go viral. And yeah. I will also tell you that um, I just had a, a real go viral that was, um, I know that that you saw it. It was one that I did with Chloe where we were just sitting on uh, the couch chicken and it had nothing to do with my, with curly content. It was just right. a kind of throwaway. Was it like a curl friend moment? Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and it got over 2 million views. And I'll tell you the following that came from that was extremely low. And I'm actually glad for that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't really like going viral, to be honest, because I really like a, a consistent um, build of my page that is relevant followers. And a lot of times and when things go viral, and- it brings in people from all walks of life that have <laughs> no idea what they're walking into when they encounter my page. And then they have weird expectations or they don't know what's happening and they make weird comments. And honestly, it's not my favorite. I just prefer my content to perform well, <laughs> but I don't like going viral. And I think that... Yeah. People go viral more now than they used to. When I was first growing my pages, it was a very steady, like 50K a year kind of growth. And then um, the last year, it has been very up and down. Like all of a sudden, I'll get a few thousand and then all of a sudden, I'll lose a few thousand. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I've paid much less attention to the number of followers in the last year because 
it, it it's just changed a lot with the algorithm on Instagram and with the prioritization of reels and especially with the prioritization of viral content that may not necessarily be what, <laughs> what mm-hmm. your primary topic is. Um, I just really focus on the people that are there who are there to see what I have to provide. I, I don't even care how many people that is as long as the people who are there are finding value. So for me, value is really important. If I just wanted to go viral, I would create a bunch of random trending videos that have nothing to do with curly hair because right. that topic attracts a very specific audience and it's much smaller than, you know, some kind of general large following. Mm-hmm. So I'm not here to have millions of followers. I, I, I'm okay with staying with 200 and even going down if that's what means that the people who are sticking around are there for what I have to to present. So it's interesting you say that because I guess I never really thought about that as far as when something, you know, a video, or whatever goes viral, that you have a bunch of people that really aren't your community. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I They're not never thought community. of that. Yeah. I never thought about that before. Yeah. Well, it's, too, I mean, true, right? Like even from the reels or the posts that I've had that like have had a larger boom. The followers that I get from that, usually I see a, a bigger drop of people anyways. And lately I haven't been caring, but I remember us talking about, you know, like, oh my gosh, I lost 60 followers today. And like Lulu would be like, I lose hundreds a day. Yeah. Right? Don't like, look at that. A day. She's like, don't look at that. Like, it literally doesn't matter. Half of them are bots anyway. Or- I'm glad that you're telling her this because I was telling her like you are driving yourself crazy by yeah looking at the uh, fluctuation so which is why i've like limited myself to social media so much now i really only do it on the weekends and then i have like you know all the memes and all the gifts and all the things that my girlfriends are sending i took um, over the sugar daddy uh social media so if you he just took over if you like it or don't like it that's on <laughs> yeah i'm like i'm tapping out i cannot i have too many things on my plate i cannot do it um okay i want to get into the nitty gritty yeah. Everybody wants to know <laughs> what does it mean to monetize, right? Like, so first year where you started having partnerships, sponsorships, people were paying you for your content. What did you make the first year? Well, so I'll tell you, even though I, I'm, um, <laughs> I'm getting all up in your business, Lou. I know, right? <laughs> I'm usually a very private person. So um, no, I think uh, what I love actually, and I'll share as much as I as I can, as I feel comfortable sharing, because I, I've i learned a ton about what I should be charging and what I could be making because mm-hmm. of having conversations with other people. So that's like the first thing I hey, would Transparency. Recommend. Sounds like corporate America. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all about, listen- this is my big thing, right? Like my girlfriends and I, we talk about our salaries. We, and I've said this before. We talk about our money. We talk about our paycheck. We do a W-2 comparison at the end of every year. Like, what did you make? What was your commission? What was your, you know, like, and it's so important because you need to make sure that you are getting what you deserve. Yes. And if you go around thinking, oh, well, I think I should, I think, uh, well, you don't know. So ask your friends, ask your your circle, right? Especially if you're in a similar industry, if you're not having those conversations, you probably are underpaid. And you know what? That's your fault. Have the conversation. Reach yeah. out to your network. It's funny you say that phrase, I think, because whenever I'm talking, especially in the client atmosphere with someone, I ask them a question they're like, I think this is like, do you know this or do you not? It's not a think and answer. Me that too. All is it, the time. There's a clear definitive answer here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you need to know, right? Like yeah. if you're if you're undercharging, it doesn't matter if it's in your corporate job or in this that you're putting maybe sometimes an extra 30 hours a week into, why would you want to be underpaid? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, so to your question, the first, so the first, um, what the rate I was making around 20,000 followers at the time there was kind of, cause this was photos, right? Um, so at the time there was like an industry standard, which was a cent per follower, um, now that's right. changed because you could have a smaller audience, but a much higher engagement rate or things like that, that can affect the rate. So at the time that was just kind of this general rule. Um, and so I was making about $200 for a post, um, which is and- really good. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's one picture and a caption. Yeah, right? a picture $200 of more a post than we currently make. So <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. Sign me up. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it blew my mind. I was like, somebody wants to pay me $200 to talk about a product I love. I mean, right. 
<laughs> and, and potentially um, send me a whole box of more stuff that I now don't have to pay for. Yes, please. Yeah. And that's the other thing is I get a ton of free product. Um, now I don't recommend people accept compensation in product. It depends on the industry. Certainly, um, my brother was in the realm of, you know, home, uh, like the home topics in, in the influencer world. And so, you know, if somebody's offering you. Beautiful. Oh, house. so this is a family thing. This is yeah, a family yeah. influence. She oh, yeah. <laughs> and just like was doing one of your, you were doing a curly video, right? And I was like, oh my gosh, where are you? You were like, oh, I'm at my brother's house. Um, I'll send you the page. And I was like, why does he have a page? Well, because he's also an influencer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it's a gorgeous, like what, like mid-century modern. Yeah, yeah. it's it's fantastic. We can link that too. It's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Out to bro. So, so for them to get, you know, like for example, like a couch or something that has like a really high value. Um, mm-hmm. certainly, you know, that's where you might have a trade-off discussion um around accepting product for compensation. But in the curly world, you know, if somebody's sending you a, a $20 bottle or even a hundred dollars worth of product. Not enough. I don't normally accept that as compensation. I need that product to create the content itself. Um, So I do love receiving product and I I love that I don't have to pay for it. But um, I I recommend also getting compensated in dollars. Um, And so that's- You cannot pay your mortgage with shampoo and gel, okay? Yeah, you'll hear- You'll hear influencers (laughs) saying that. Like, I can't pay my bills with shampoo. Right. Um, (laughs) Okay, so I can't tell you, I can't remember what I was making um, in 2017 for the full year, but I can tell you what I've made um, in the last three years. So in 2020, I was close to about 10K for the year, and that's um, with sponsorships and affiliate links um, or codes. So that just to take a sidestep, I'll explain that really quick because you mentioned that briefly earlier, Jess, but um, there are a couple different ways that I get paid. So I, I mentioned that $200 a post, that's a sponsorship. So that's a brand saying, okay, for a specific piece of content or for a campaign of multiple pieces of content, we'll pay you this total lump sum. And then other brands um, will do a discount code or a link, an affiliate link. And usually those are commission-based. So you might get 10, 20% of any sales that somebody... um, that, that they get based on the code that they've given you. So those are those are the two different ways that I monetize. Um, and then it's usually with brands. And then also I get a very small amount from like Google ads on YouTube. I have a very small YouTube presence and I mm. post there very rarely. Um, and then I've tried to monetize my reels. I'll talk about that um, a little bit in a little bit because that's kind of with this future direction of the platforms themselves compensating uh, influencers. Um, but yeah, so when I talk about 10K in the in 2020, that was for the most part with sponsorships and um, affiliate codes from brands. In 2021, I was making uh, 20K about per year. So I about doubled. And then last year I made almost 40K. So I've basically been doubling every year for the past yeah. couple of years. Can we just do a round of applause? That is, that is excellent. <laughs> that is absolutely fantastic. Yes. Yeah. It's, uh, again, it's mind blowing to me as well um, because I just didn't even see that coming. I had no idea what was possible. And I'll tell you that what I'm doing is on the low end of what's possible. Um, I mentioned earlier that I don't pitch. Um, I am not the best person to ask about negotiation because I'm very picky about my partnerships, as I think people should be. Um, but it's also based on what kind of time commitment I can can give. And it's also very often based on... So aside from the two things you mentioned earlier, the filters that I put on partnerships are, do I love the products? I have to. Um, and then do I love the company itself. Um, If the company aligns with my values, then yes, I want to partner with them. So those are the two things that have to, that have to pass. But on top of that, because I have to be really selective with how I spend my time and I want this to bring me joy. I really prefer partnerships with brands that allow a lot of flexibility in, in my content. So if a Mm -hmm. brand is telling me like, here's your script, and this is exactly what you have to create. I really don't find joy in that. And so yeah. usually I'll turn that down, even if those other first two filters are matched, 
Um, so I'm pretty picky about who I'm working with because I like, I like to have that flexibility to, to be creative and to do it kind of on my schedule or the way I want to do it. Um, intentional. Once yeah. again, being if very like intentional. By the state and you're like, oh, I really don't want to wash my hair and go through my 12 step process. <laughs> yeah. and I'm like, it's a no for me. Right. Yeah. Like- <laughs> I also think, you know, you structuring who you work with in the manner that you're doing it ma- comes through in your videos. Yeah. Because you, you don't look like you're being labored yeah. to do it. Yeah. I'm enjoying it. <laughs> I have to. So I have a quick question for you. So, yeah. Uh, you know, the way my finance mind works um, with, you know, you being influencer now, like, do you have a separate like LLC in which? Uh-oh. So I don't. And I'm kicking myself for that because I know I should. And um, my friends who are in the space who are also doing this, whether it's a side gig or full time, um, have done that. And I just, I just haven't. And I couldn't even tell you really why, except for that. I just haven't dug into that yet. And I, I know I should, or maybe well, I should ask you. Brandon, honestly, honestly, I- just now, like, so based off of, you know, you're, you're just past year. Cause yeah, you should have had an LLC probably to begin with, but then, um, with an LLC, there's different ways that they're taxed. And the main difference is based upon maybe one, how many people are part of the LLC, but then also um, how much money you have coming in. Mm. So you, know, you might want to take a look into obviously creating an LLC and maybe it having it taxed as an escort now, because that could save you in taxes. Because I'm assuming that Brandon's scheduling. Like assuming that you're yeah. a 10, because I mean, the businesses are probably writing you 1099s, you know, as a sole proprietor. Yeah. So a yeah. way for you to keep more of the money that they're sending you. Well, and to offset, you know, you're buying... Expenses and microphones, and you know, I we'll mean, talk. We can talk yeah. if you would yeah. like. <laughs> we need to talk because the other question I have is like, well, okay, so if I'm if I'm just counting that as additional income, and I already make a really good income in my day job, you know, I'm I'm starting to get up there from a tax perspective. I've wondered about that as well. If if that's not to my benefit, it would be beneficial to LLC um, and have a tax at an S corp based upon the income, you know, you said you currently had coming in because yeah. that'll allow you to s- keep more and save more on taxes. Okay. Okay, cool. I, I had a feeling that was the case, but I have, I just haven't done that yet. So I will do that this year. That'll be my yeah, 2023 goal. goal. Yes. Yep. Okay. All right. So you're doubling your income went from 10 K to 20 K to 40 K. Are you looking at like projections for this year or are you just like, mm, it's a side hustle? Like where's your mind? Yeah. So, um, I'm a very, I I love data. I like, as soon as Instagram started providing analytics on my audience, I, I became addicted to it and and it can be bad. That's why, you know, we talked about Mm -hmm. don't pay attention to your unfollows. That doesn't, it doesn't matter. Um, so crushing though. It is, it can, but you got to tell yourself like, well, those are people you want around anyway. Cause what they'll, if, if you forced them to, they would probably just complain and not interact with your content anyway. So, Right. Um, your engagement rate is really important and that will go up if, if your audience comes down in, in a healthy way. So, right. um, but anyways, yes, I love, to, math. I love to measure <laughs> and, um, <laughs> I, um, so I do have like, I call it a bowler because that's a term that we use in, in my like day job, but I have like a, a spreadsheet where I forecasted. I've done this now for the last two years where I, I kind of set some goals for myself and, and also tried to project like, what do I think I'll be making based on, you know, what I did this year? And mm-hmm. so, um, so yeah, I've, I've, I did that the last couple of years and I'm in the process of doing that for this year. I don't necessarily think I'm going to double again this year. Um, just because my, my audience isn't necessarily doubling anymore the way it used to. Mm-hmm. And also, um, I feel like what it's going to take to get to doubling my number is not what I have the time and, and energy for. I just got a puppy. I just bought yeah. a house a few months ago. So, you know, just from a life balance standpoint, if I was still taking in 40k, if I just hit plan from last yeah. year, <laughs> yeah, I'm fine with insane. that. Yeah. Okay. What are you? And you don't have to answer this. Um, but you know how some athletes are like, oh, I only spend money on my like from my uh, what is it? Like their commercials. Or like, no like they don't oh. like spend their paycheck. They only spend like their endorsement. Spend, their money. endorsement. I was going to call it sponsorship, but yes, their endorsement money. Do you spend? 
this extra money or are you like hoarding it away? What are you doing with it? (laughs) So um, because I'm fortunate enough to have a really well-paying day job um, and I'm a single person household with not a lot of expenses, um, I kind of looked at, I have previously looked at my Instagram money as more fun money. Now, as that has grown, I don't need That's that a lot much of fun, girl. <laughs> I don't need that much fun money. I'm not that much fun. So, um, so I'm definitely saving more. Um, but it used to be that, you know, I would say 10K, that was an amount that I would be like, okay, I'm gonna travel with that, or I'm gonna take a vacation yeah. with my boyfriend or whatever. Um and and not feel any guilt, you know. I'll mm-hmm. I, I would I would even sometimes splurge a little for myself. Obviously, that's all relative, but you know, thinking like, okay, I want to go on vacation with some friends, and and they don't, you know, have the means the way I do. So I'm just gonna buy us like a buy us rent us a mansion for the week, you know, and yeah. and and it's a few thousand dollars that like if I was spending that for my hard earned day job, I'd be like, ouch. But because it's my side gig, I'm like, okay, I don't know. Just mentally, it doesn't feel so extreme. So I've done some things like that, but I would say as that amount has gone up and I haven't needed as much for um, fun money, then I'll, I've been saving. And like, for example, I said, I just bought a house a few months ago. Um, Congratulations. My ability, yes. Thank you. My ability, I mean, to do that by myself, that was also something I never thought I'd be able to do. So to do that, it, it took saving, you know, I needed to be able to save up for a down payment. I knew I could handle monthly payments, but you got to have a chunk that you can set down. And so, um, so yeah, I, I, that, that's kind of, I think what's helped me to be in this position financially to buy a house was that I started to tuck away some of that money. Mm -hmm. Um, and when I kind of look at my full, my full like portfolio, you know, I've got my savings and my checking just like anybody. And then, um, I do have like a retirement account through my day job and, um, and then one of my goals for this year is to start a Roth IRA. So I'm trying to like Brandon can help French you. With that. Yes, Brandon, <laughs> I'll be talking with you. Uh, so, so yeah. Well, I don't, I, the thing is, we got to see if she qualifies for one because you know. No, you might be making too much. You money. might be making too much oh, money. No. I, I could. Be there's a way. There's a way. There's ways around it, but we. Yeah. we we don't need to get into that right now. Okay. We'll have to do <laughs> There's legal to ways around it. There's say. legal. They are perfect. You know, there are perfectly legal ways to backdoor Roth IRA. <laughs> you say backdoor, I'm like, that does not sound good, but it is totally legal. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like, I mean, you're using this to really build out a very reliable financial portfolio. And I think that is really smart. And I'm just so proud of how you've grown because it is a business for you, right? Even though you don't have an LLC yet, but you yeah. <laughs> But it <laughs> is a business. Like yeah. <laughs> yes, it's a time commitment. It's, you know, it's an investment. Um, so I want to know, and we're not going to get into like what you make per post now and per reel. And I know all of those dollar figures vary from, you know, company to company and and all of that. But what have you learned along the way? Oh man, I've learned so much. So <laughs> <laughs> I mean, okay, a couple of things. One is like definitely find community in whatever your side gig is, but especially if you have an interest in doing something on social media. Um, I would say when I said that I was spending that much time, that wasn't necessarily on the content itself. That was engaging with the community um, and making friends and supporting people and being part of this like ecosystem. And because like when you put put in, it will give back. So if you're just pumping out content, hoping to go viral, but you're never engaging with anyone, you're not going to grow a natural and healthy community. And so, and, and through community in that space, you'll start to befriend other influencers. And over time, you know, I, I really wished at the beginning that I had that I had those connections because I learned a lot over time of starting to benchmark with other influencers who were transparent and, and maybe they're not broadcasting it on their page, but they would be willing to share one-on-one, um, reach out and ask anytime somebody in the curly community asks me what I'm charging or what to charge, I will engage with them and help them and tell them as much as I can, because I want 
I want people to get paid what they're worth. And so, um, so I think that was a major learning for me that just took time. I, I feel like, you know, it can be so secretive what people make and, and yeah. people don't want to share. And, um, I think you'd be surprised how much people would share with you if you ask. So that was a, a major one for me. It cuts down the learning curve is mm-hmm. talking to more experienced people. Yeah. Well, yeah. in, in, I mean, in you can't go to Glassdoor and be like, what do influencers make, right? Like, it's, <laughs> it's not a thing. So you have to ask. And I know you you sent me your brand kit when I was trying to build mine. And you really, to your point, right, you can't just throw out and expect people to give, give, give. Like, you have to give mm-hmm. as well. And, like, it doesn't matter what I post or what I do. Lou is always, like, there with a comment, there with a the heart, there with you know, something. And it's, it's always just been so encouraging. And so then when you do slide into the DMS and you're like, Hey girl, can you um, share this with me? Right. You've already like, you've seen that name. You've, you've been engaging like, and you know, I, my following is nowhere near yours. Right. But like when people pop in and they ask for something and it's like, I've never seen your name. I've never seen you comment. I've never seen you even like a post. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> why, you know, it's almost like, why do I need to give you time? And I know that yeah. sounds no, it's a little icky, but it's like, you yeah. don't even give me like the courtesy of a like or a comment on my stuff. And now you're up in my... Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> okay. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> Got to talk about it. Listen, do not slide up into somebody's DMs and ask them a question and ask them essentially what you're asking is I need your time. I need okay. your help. Please help me. And then when you go to that person's page and it says follow, right? Like, or, or it's either says follow or follow back. Listen, do not slide into somebody's DMs asking yep. for something. And it says follow back when I look at your page. Yep. No, delete, deny. That is rude, <laughs> rude, rude, rude. I, I told totally- you, you know, they just follow you and then they slide in your DMs and they ask for something and it's like, okay, you're trying to play the game, but you're playing it really, really poorly. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. It's, it's kind of the golden rule kind of situation. Like treat people the way you want to be treated. If you got a, qu- if somebody reached out to you asking you something and they weren't following you or engaging with you, and especially if their message was really demanding, like yes. it, instead of saying hello and how are you and I, <laughs> I owe you contact. something. Yeah. I can't even yeah. imagine the messages you get because I know what I've gotten over time. And I'm just like, I don't owe you anything. I haven't had this experience because I am no by no means even close to being the I an influencer. <laughs> Listen, I just know with my peon following, which thanks to all my followers, but like, you know, I'm not, (laughs) I'm not even trying to be out there anymore. I just can't even imagine what you're getting and how frustrating it is. Cause you're like, you really do like you pour into content and into people and you are giving back. So then for people to just be like, and it's like, hi, hello, how are you? Do you know how to engage with people? Yeah. And then I'll even get somebody who's like, hello, like after two hours. (laughs) It's like, I'm sorry. I've been in 18 hours worth of meetings back to back. Like, who do you think you are? Also, I I don't know you. (laughs) Patience, people. Like, uh, just no. Just no. Oh, my gosh. Okay. I don't even know what we were talking about before this. I'm thankful that hopefully that, I mean, I'm I'm (sighs) assuming that a majority of your audience is, is female. Mm-hmm. So yeah, like hopefully you don't get the terrible messages from like guys. Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah. So about 98% of my audience is female and there are curly men um, or curly non-binary. Um, and so, you know, that's one of the things about Instagram that only divides currently um, yeah. to those two groups. Um, it is rare that I get a, a person coming to my page and trying to engage with me who's not interested in curly content. So that's, that's actually good. That's good. Yeah. really great. Yeah. It's very that's rare good. that I get a creepy message from someone. I think it happens, you know, maybe a couple of times a month and, and I, I just don't even, mm-hmm. I just delete the messages. So, but I, I, I do have to admit that like, that was one of my internal biases 
um, when I was first starting my page is that any time a non-female would reach out to me, I would you be assumed like, that they were like, talk to me. Yeah. And then yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a couple of times I realized that they were actually real followers who were men with curly hair. And, and I was like, oh my goodness, that was, Aww. that, that was totally my internal bias. I needed a check. So yeah, I've tried over time to be a little bit more careful about, you know, judging people right away. Yeah. And, and um, or sometimes you get people who in their pictures, they show straight hair and they have straight hair, but they might be having curly kids or a curly partner. And so. So, yeah, I think you have to you, you got to give people a little bit of benefit of the doubt. But, yes, there are also creepy people and you just got to, like, not engage. with yeah. them. <laughs> yeah. OK, we were we were talking about lessons, right? Like lessons learned. What do you wish you would have known or done? Well, what is I was. What is the number one thing that if you can go back to 2017 yourself, what is the one piece of advice that you would give yourself? Oh, that's a good one. I mean, probably if I could go back and talk to myself, then I would tell myself some of the things that I tell you just now, right? Is like not to worry about all of the things. When I first started doing my page and and when I started to I should say when I first started to try to grow it, I was very susceptible to the stress that comes with social media and trying to grow a page. I mean, it was, it was, I, and I was posting every day. So like I had, I'm, I'm an achiever on the Enneagrams. If, if you guys are familiar with those. Same, that's why we're we're IG besties. (laughs) Clever friends. And so, you know, I'm like, oh, okay, well now I'm going to figure out the formula and I'm going to commit. And I was posting every day Mm -hmm. on the dot and if something didn't hit right, if it, you know, if I got, you know, a few likes or, or low engagement, like I was really hard on myself and it was very stressful. And at the same time, I was, um, sharing that, that kind of, you know, building a page journey with some other friends who have since fizzled out because they, it just, it's just was not bringing joy to their lives. And so, I'm like, I'm one of those. (laughs) And I understand that completely. Like, I think for me to be successful over multiple years, I had to get to a point where it, where I didn't feel that way about it. Um, and so I think that's the piece that if you really want that payoff and if you, if you want the longevity, you, you can't let it eat you alive. Um, you know, these, these platforms, you have to remember too that the platforms are not your friends. They're intentionally, there's a reason why that video mm-hmm. that I mentioned went viral and didn't bring in followers because mm-hmm. it will, it was polarizing content to certain people. And it, and the more that there was some arguing happening in content in, in the comments, the more that it's shown to people. Was so, that about Chick-fil-A? Yeah. Yeah. Ugh. And, and, how did I know that? Mm-hmm. you know, I didn't even know about the background with that and how that would yeah. be influencing the people. And, and I, probably wouldn't have posted it if, if I'd known that. So it wasn't, it wasn't. Yeah. That's, just, but I, I remember the the video, of course, and I was like, what were they, they were eating Chick-fil-A. So I knew when you said the comments, I was like, oh, I can only yeah. imagine. So. It was it, not, like people post to stir the pot because they want attention and they want to go but that's not you and that's not Chloe. So yeah. No. It's so, interesting that you, sorry, it's interesting that you said like, you know, the platforms are not your friend because- it's so true. The, well, the big move, the big um, focus uh, for Web3 is actual ownership of everything. So, for example, like, you know, if you're utilizing these platforms, you know, Instagram, uh, TikTok, whatever it may be, you own your content, but you don't own your content because if they just shut down tomorrow, mm-hmm. your platform is gone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And That's the, what you say to have like an evergreen like YouTube or and not the, that YouTube couldn't. Right. That's what I'm saying. YouTube could shut yeah. down. So the Web3 focus is that you own all aspects of it and you have your own individual platform that you own. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and so is that on the blockchain then? It's or part of that. I don't know how. Um, it's, you know, it, that is oh, part gosh. of it to make, to make it easier. They're all kind of grouped in together. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that that's the thing is it's like they the platforms change all the time. You can't like I mentioned that my growth in the last year has been very up and down. And that changes. Like 
just the other day I was hearing that now photos are starting to be prioritized again on Instagram. And it's like, okay, I mean, some of that information is helpful. And sure, you know, try doing some photos then and and seeing how that helps your page grow. But but don't let that like eat you alive if that's if that tactic isn't successful. Like just I think resilience is is a piece that's really needed in this space to to continue on and to be successful. And and that's something that I, I don't totally know how I got to that point um, <laughs> because I was not healthy with it for like the first couple of years. It, it was very stressful and worrisome. And then especially when I was working with brands because you feel this pressure to succeed so that they want to work with right. you again. And so that like you want it to be a successful partnership. And the thing is, Instagram deprioritizes properly tagged sponsored content because they don't want brands to pay you for ads. They want brands to pay them for ads. So, you know, that's why a lot of, I think that's kind of behind the scenes. A lot of people don't realize like why influencers wouldn't disclose. I always disclose because I know my audience will know otherwise and they would not appreciate that. And it's just what's right anyway. But I take a hit on engagement every time Mm -hmm. I post a sponsored post because it's almost always performing lower than my other content. And so that that's just, that's another example of where the platform is not your friend. And so just know that going in. And I think that's what I wish I would have known at the beginning because I wouldn't have put so much of like myself into it in a negative, like stressful way. I like that you said about the resilient part as far as Mm -hmm. not necessarily focusing on all the different algorithms per se. And, you know, does this do better than this content, but more or less focusing on what it is you actually want to um, produce for your audience and focus on that. It was very, the reason it was very interesting to me is because I literally this morning was looking, (laughs) I was looking at a video of like an old um, Jay-Z interview from like a while ago and him talking about how, when he first started rapping, he was going around looking for record deals and nobody wanted to sign him. They were all like, you're terrible. Nobody wants to sign you. And he's like, I could have just said, Hey, maybe they're right. Or I could just keep doing what I liked and, you know, try to see if that works Mm -hmm. and look at him now. (laughs) You can't figure out the algorithm, right? That's the, that's the infuriating thing. You feel like you got it. They don't want you to figure out. Right. And then like the next day it changes. (laughs) And, but if you go in with the mentality of, Instagram is not your friend. Facebook is not your friend. Twitter is not your friend. Like that just makes so much more sense. I love that. Yeah. And then to your point, you got to be your own friend, like post what you want. And certainly you can use the analytics to guide where you, you know, for example, (laughs) this is a joke I used to have with some of my girlfriends early on, because when I would look at the posts that performed the best of all my photo posts, it was there's always put pictures of the back of my head. I remember you saying that. <laughs> yes. They're like, they don't want to see my face. Yeah. And so <laughs> look, your face, y'all. Nothing. Um, you know, but it, it was just funny because um, you know, I had that moment where I thought, okay, well, I could either just for the rest of time post pictures of the back of my head because that's what <laughs> they know people want. Or I could put that in there every once in a while knowing that they want it but I'm also going to do content that's what I you know just what I want to do and so yeah I think I understand that yeah the post that I have of like of Jess if I post anything with Jess or the kids significantly better than anything I post about myself <laughs> you're like why do people not like me <laughs> it's like oh like I post something about myself I get two likes I post something about the kids and Jess a thousand likes <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's it's just funny. I remember when you told me that a while back about like, well, people only want to see the back of my head. So (laughs) I have loved everything about this conversation. I know that we could talk about all of this for like 20 more hours and beyond. Totally. Is Besides that Instagram is not your friend. I'm going to ask you like one question that we didn't talk about. Could you see yourself being a full-time influencer and walking away from your day job? So um, I won't name who this is, but one of my friends who does this full-time has been extremely successful. And even though I have a very well-paying day job, she makes more than than I make (laughs) in my day job. So it has definitely crossed my mind because I'm like, wow, I mean, if that's the potential, if I could actually, you know, 
completely change over my my income and not lose um yeah i because i didn't i didn't used to think that was the biggest reason was i have a day job that pays me way more than that would ever pay and actually that's not necessarily true um but i so i won't say never just but i still haven't and and am not planning to because as much as i love that space Um, it's a very small part of who I am. There's a lot of things that I really enjoy. And, um, I don't know that I would want to spend more time on that topic than, than I already am. And so Mm -hmm. I, I just find my, my day job currently to be very fulfilling intellectually. There's a lot of different avenues I can take that. I don't necessarily see a career path that's as exciting and interesting to me in the influencer space. Um, So that's the biggest reason that I haven't done that yet. And that could change at some point. What I love is that kind of, I think Brandon touched up on this um, at the very beginning, but, or maybe I think you did actually Jess, but that idea around the environment that we're in economically and, you know, having a, a side gig that helps you, especially if something was to happen with your day job. I mean, I'm not immune to layoffs. Um, and I, I work in a fairly recession proof business, but it's not a hundred percent. So, you know, if I were to lose my job, having that side gig to kind of ramp up if I needed to, that makes me feel so much safer. So mm-hmm. in some ways too, just from differentiating, you know, my portfolio, I guess, or, or however you yeah, want multiple to streams it. of income. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. And you meant- you mentioned, you know, you're single and now you have a house. And so heaven forbid something happen, it's you, it's on you, yeah. right? Yeah. Where some people might have a spouse or a partner, or, you know, like to, to offset, but at least you have something that is bringing in, in some cases, more than other people make for their entire career, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Which Absolutely. is... Yeah, which is is so fantastic. So I think that's a really great answer, right? Never say never. I saw that <laughs> on a bumper sticker on a minivan the other day, and I just laughed so hard. <laughs> I was like, I, I, I will like, never I, have a minivan. But. I feel like there's some things I could definitely say, never say never. Yeah. Like, I, I, I will, there's certain things I will never yeah. do. So. <laughs> like this, it's never. <laughs> yeah, with something like this, you have, you know, the creativity, the flexibility, brands are always changing. I mean, never say never. I think that's a good answer. So. Lulu, thank you so much for being with us today. This has been, my face hurts because we've, I think we've all been smiling. I know the entire time. This was such a joyful conversation. So helpful. We will link your social media so that people can go follow you, especially if you're curly, you've got to follow Lulu. She's the best. Her content is genuine. All of that hopefully is reflected in our conversation today. What you see is what you get, which is a beautiful curly girl who's making it. And I just love it. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. It's been such a pleasure talking with both of you. Don't forget, Benjamin Franklin said, an investment in knowledge pays the best interest. You just got paid. Until next time. Thanks for listening to today's episode. We are so glad to have you as part of our Sugar Daddy community. If you learned something today, please remember to subscribe, rate, review, and share this episode with your friends, family, and extended network. Don't forget to connect with us on social media at the Sugar Daddy Podcast. You can also email us your questions you want us to answer for our Pass the Sugar segments at the Sugar Daddy Podcast at gmail.com or leave us a voicemail through our Instagram.